Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about the best recordings of Mendelssohn's music to a Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, everybody loves this music, right? I mean, if you don't love it, I really don't want to hear it. It would just be too depressing. A Midsummer Night's Dream is one of the great, great examples of incidental music that we have. And incidental music, incidental music is a, ter it's a terrible name, incidental music. I'm not quite sure. It means music to accompany incidents. In other words, action music, movie music, music to accompany dramatic scenes in like a film, except they didn't have films back in the 1820s and when Mendelssohn started writing the thing. And so, and so they had plays and theaters had orchestras, big orchestras, quite often, larger than symphony orchestras as often as not. If you look, for example, at Beethoven's incidental music, you will find that he invariably had extra instruments, trombones and percussion and other stuff available for his incidental scores that he did not have for uh, the average symphonic score. And it's as a result of this dichotomy between theatrical music and symphonic music that we got the absolutely loathsome, vile, horrible German custom or prejudice against using those instruments in the symphony orchestra when you write a symphony. It's for that reason, for example, that percussion was largely ignored in the German symphony for most of the 19th century. And for example, when César Franck used an English horn in his symphony in D minor in France in the 1880s even, it caused a riot, a riot. Can you believe it? I mean, it's absolutely nuts. Why? Because certain instruments were associated with certain non-musical phenomena. You know, English horns are kind of like, you know, cows, <laughs> you know, the pastoral scenes out in the countryside and things like that. And that was considered to be not symphonic. You know, never mind that Haydn and Beethoven were, were using every instrument they could get their hands on legitimately in their symphonies. They had no problem with it. But the somewhat anal retentive Victorian, uh, you know, mid 19th century conservative uh, music, you know, whatever they're called, cabal that <laughs> was in charge of these things, uh, they had issues with them. And it's also ironic that that the center of this cabal was the Leipzig Conservatory founded by Mendelssohn, because Mendelssohn was more than happy to use extra instruments when he could get his hands on them. His score to A Midsummer Night's Dream uses uses cymbals, which he didn't have very often and didn't use very often. And the overture, the overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream uses an ophicleide. I mean, an ophicleide, which was the forerunner of the bass tuba as the orchestral bass. And it's probably, as Tovey said, the only piece ever written that properly uses the ophicleide. It actually sounds good because Mendelssohn was an extraordinary orchestrator, even at the age of 18, when he wrote the overture. Now, he wrote the rest of the incidental music a couple years later, a couple years later, two, two decades later, he was when he was in Berlin and, you know, back working for the, the the King of Prussia, who at that point was, I mean, you know, it was where we were well past the day when Prussia was run by a guy like Frederick the Great. I mean, I don't remember who the King of Prussia was when Mendelssohn was there, but it was something like Wilhelm the Average. He wasn't, he wasn't a very impressive Kaiser. And Mendelssohn hated Berlin and hated working for him. And, and, but he still managed when he wrote the rest of the incidental music for an actual play uh, of Midsummer Night's Dream to recapture perfectly the mood and the, and the character that he had expressed so beautifully in the early overture. Now, the overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream and the actual, the actual incidental music wonderfully, wonderfully characterizes the personnel in the actual play, in Shakespeare's play. The, you know, the play takes place on, on three levels. 
There's the fairy music, which was a Mendelssohnian specialty. Nobody did sort of elfin, fantastical, swift, fairy type magical music better than Mendelssohn did. And that's how the overture begins with the fairy music. And then you've got, you know, sort of the, the, the human lovers and, you know, the, the basic human lover types. And then you've got the aristocrats who are, you know, symbolized by heraldic fanfares. And then you've got the rude mechanicals, you know, the peasants, the rustics who are mounting a play for the royal wedding. And so, you know, the rustic, the rustics are a folk dance, you know, in the overture, the part that goes, bam, 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 ba da dum ba da dum ba da dum ba da dum bum 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 And that, bum 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 that's a hee-haw, hee-haw, because it symbolizes, remember, Bottom gets a an ass's head stuck on him at some point by a fairy enchantment. And all of that stuff is in this overture. Really, really remarkably clearly portrayed and beautifully portrayed. And of course, the overture and incidental music have been recorded hundreds of billions of times. And we're going to talk about the performances. The thing about A Midsummer Night's Dream that you really need to keep in mind, I think, is that it, it requires playing of great virtuosity and deftness. I love the word deft. I mean, Mendelssohn was a deft composer. That means precise, swift, and always, I mean, the opening woodwind chords alone, they're just a simple woodwind chords, like flutes and clarinets, you know, but they have to be played with such intonational purity. You know, there's, there's, the, the color is so new and so perennially fresh, but it's not easy to do. You can only imagine what it sounded like in Mendelssohn's day, you know, probably pretty scary. You know, nothing was in tune with anything else back in the 1820s. But it really, it's, it's uh, such beautiful, beautiful music. Now, the real question with recordings is how much of it you actually play. Because Mendelssohn's actual score, the whole thing, is, is quite extensive. But it's cued, it's cued to the German version of the play. And, and so it has choruses, it has songs, it has tiny little, tiny little bits of music that, you know, just go for, for, you know, scenic amplification, basically, you know, they don't, there's no, they have no independent existence. They're not extended numbers. What we usually hear as the overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream, I mean, as the overture, as the music to A Midsummer Night's Dream is the overture and then a suite of pieces. And those pieces are the intermezzo, the nocturne, the scherzo, and the wedding march. So it's sort of like a five movement suite and all. That's, that's usually what we get. Now, you can also add in some songs or you can do more extended, extended songs and choruses and other music that Mendelssohn wrote. It's all a question of how much time you have to fill up on your CD and how much you want to do and, you know, what forces you've, you've brought in to do them. So, you know, all of these performances are going to be slightly different in how much of A Midsummer Night's Dream you actually get. But I want to start in talking about recordings with the, the more or less complete incidental score. And you can get that rather, rather easily. And I have two recordings here, which I think are very, very good and very easy to do it with. There's first this four disc set on Capriccio that contains all of Mendelssohn's major incidental music. Um, you get you get uh, Antigone, Oedipus, Athaliah, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, some of these other ones are quite substantial, quite marvelously substantial. But most of what Mendelssohn wrote for his other incidental scores were were choruses. There are overtures and mostly vocal music because the plays themselves called for vocal music, especially Greek tragedies. You have chor the chorus, you know, I mean, doing choral things. And so Mendelssohn wrote choruses and they're very good choruses. I mean, they're quite beautiful, but they may not interest you terribly in, in terms of, you know, what's either what's going on in the play or what they're singing about. And, you know, Athaliah contains, of course, the war march of the priests, which was exceptionally popular in Victorian England. And more than anything else, the popularity of that particular piece um, 
really helps us to understand why the British Empire was doomed to crumble because it's an incredibly lame piece of music. I don't know anyone could like the War March of the Priests. Ugh, it's awful. But, you know, Mendelssohn, you know, perfect as he tried to be, had his lapses. And I think the War March of the Priests was one of them. It's just awful. But that, that's, that's incidental. Other people may like it. I don't know. But you can get all four discs of incidental music and uh, at a pretty good price with a bunch of people. Um, it's the Cologne Radio Symphony Orchestra under Hans Funk doing the, uh, the, the Midsummer Night's Dream. And that's really, uh, it's really a very nice performance. So there it is. That's one way to get a lot of Mendelssohn incidental music if you want to go, you want to go deluxe. But just for a Midsummer Night's Dream, I think the easiest way to do it um, is, is to get this one. The New Zealand Symphony with James Judd, who I've said many times is an excellent conductor and who's done marvelous work on Naxos with the New Zealand Symphony. And this is no exception. You get, you get the spoken text in English and the melodramas in English. The melodrama is, of course, simply music underneath a spoken text as opposed to singing. That's a melodrama. And melodrama... I just have to tell you this because it's such a great story. Melodrama was, was extremely popular in the 19th century. And there were some composers who specialized in writing melodramas. And the Czech composer, Zdenek Fibich, who wrote some lovely symphonies and who we talked about in, for his tone poem, Toman and the Wood Nymph, you know, he wrote the ultimate example of 19th century melodrama. It was called Hippodamia. And Hippodamia is a complete Wagnerian trilogy, a melodrama, which Superfawn recorded and issued a few years ago, and I have it. And believe you me, it's, it's hours and hours of spoken dialogue with music underneath. It's quite the extraordinary piece. But there are melodramas in, in Beethoven's Fidelio, and melodramas in Carmen, and, and, and there are melodramas in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, I personally detest melodrama. I mean, listening to Hippodamia was one of the greatest chores of my life as a critic, and it was kind of my fault that I had to do it because, because I didn't know that this thing existed. I, I mean, I knew that it existed. I didn't know it had been recorded. And years and years and years ago, when I had first met the lovely, lovely people running Superfun in the 1990s, just after the collapse of communism, when, you know, they were sort of coming out and joining the West and whatnot, I was talking to the managing director of Superfun. And I said, did you know that Fibich, you know, wrote this thing called Hippodamia? And he looked at me and he said, oh, we have it. We're going to issue it. And I said, that's great. Why don't you issue it? So, of course, I had to review it. I mean, when it came out, I had to talk about Hippodamia. It was my own damn fault. So you have to be careful what you wish for. Anyway, this is an excellent Midsummer Night's Dream, even with the melodramas. You get it lasts, let's see, 76 minutes. That's how long this thing can stretch out. And that, of course, doesn't even include the rest of the play, which goes for, you know, I mean, several hours and several acts. So, so if you want a really good sense of how all of the incidental music works in the context of the play in English, which is nice, um, although technically it ought to be in German, but, you know, who, who's counting? Uh, this is a great bet. The Naxos recording with James Judd. All the other versions here are some mixture of a suite, the incidental music, just the orchestral bits, and uh, sometimes some vocal bits thrown in. Now, are we ready? Here we go. And we're going to blow through these rather quickly because, because uh, they're all very good. And it's just a question of which one you want, you know, which one you can find. I mean, you'll have your favorites, of course, but these are excellent versions. Oh my goodness, they're vacuuming outside. Hang on a second, I'm going to, to take a pause while the vacuum goes away. Actually, it was perfect timing because we're just getting started. All right, talk about recordings. You gotta start with Toscanini. You have to, you have to, because first of all, Toscanini's performing aesthetic was kind of made for Mendelssohn. That is exceptional precision, fleetness, and, and rhythmic 
acuity. I mean, that's that's Mendelssohn, you know. But beyond that, it was Toscanini who really sort of showed us just how exciting and virtuosic this music was. I mean, his recordings of the scherzo itself were were legendary. I mean, the scherzo requires unbelievable precision to get the woodwinds to go. It's amazing. So, I mean, Toscanini is great in Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream music. It really was one of his specialties, and his performance really ought to be heard by everybody because it's kind of it's kind of a standard from which you can triangulate how well everybody else does with it. He was amazing in that music. Here's one that I was, you know, nobody pays attention to, of course, or ever paid attention to um, recently, but it's really quite, quite fine and quite beautiful and amazingly well played. Ormandy with Philadelphia. This is a French Sony version of it. So it's the Songe de Nuit d'été, um, the dream of a summer night. You sort of, I don't know, you get the mid, you lose the mid when you do it in French, don't you? You know, the whole point is that it's midsummer, and this is just a summer night. Maybe they have no midsummer in France. You know, I mean, you you could certainly do midsummer. Maybe it's the eh, eh, the songe du nuit uh, average d'été. No, average that doesn't work. How would you do it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea how you would do it in French. Um, so this comes with the Italian symphony, which is marvelous, and the scherzo from the octet, and the war march of the priests from Athalia. You know, I mean, because it was still kind of even popular back in the 20th century. Anyway, this is a wonderful Mendelssohn disc with Ormandy and Philly on Sony. I, 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 and you get you get only four bits. You get the overture, the scherzo, the nocturne, and the wedding march. Boy, it's good. Just wonderful. All right. Here's one that's a little a little quirkier, but it's it's also considerable fun. I can't even get it out of its box here, so there may be glare. Harnicourt. Harnicourt. Let me turn it this way. I can sort of angle it. There you go. Uh, this the, Here you get some vocal numbers. You get, you know, the song, you know, Ye Spotted Snakes or whatever that thing is and uh, some some choirs and the the choral finale but you know the nice thing about this and there also is like there's some little dancey things that you can throw in there you also get the erste walpurgisnacht which is great that is just great that's a cantata it's a fabulous cantata i really i got to talk about it sometime with musical examples if i can because it's just a beautiful work thematically it's related to the scottish symphony and it's it's a goethe poem because, you know, Mendelssohn and Goethe were best buds. And wow, is it fun. But this is a really, really good, you know, it's, it's Harnoncourt, you know. I mean, you hear things that you never heard before. Uh, you know, some of the tempi are a little weird, but it's colorful and full of, full of character. It's really lots of fun. It really is. A very, very famous version that I really have to mention is this one. This is Peter Mogg with the London Symphony. Um, and you get like, let's see, you get quite a bit of it in here. Let's, let me see how much of it actually pops up. Yeah, the overture, the scherzo, you get you spotted snakes, the intermezzo, the nocturne, the wedding march, the dance of the clowns. That's the other dancey thing I was talking about. And the finale. And of course, you get one of the great Scottish symphonies. You know, Peter Mogg's Scottish symphony has been a big deal, especially in the English musical press since it came out. And it's really excellent. It's first class, absolutely first class. They were totally correct in, in making that call. So um, I've been looking around for this. It seems to be like majorly out of print, which I don't understand, but I have to mention it. So it's the Decca Peter Mogg one. And then there's this one. This is really, really good. First of all, you get extended excerpts. This is like the whole thing almost. And you get with it the Hebrides Overture, the Roy Bloss Overture, conducted by Ansermay, but the Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream Overture and incidental music and other stuff is conducted by Raphael Frubeck de Burgos, who was one of those conductors who kind of flew under the radar. He was a wonderful conductor, really wonderful conductor. I saw some of the most exciting concerts I've ever seen in my life 
uh, led by him in, in with the National Symphony in Washington, where he was sort of guest conducting for a lot of time. But this is a beautiful, beautiful performance. It's on eloquence. It's with the uh, New Philharmonia. Yeah, the New Philharmonia. And it's, it's a terrific, a terrific performance of extended excerpts, including the melodramas and some of the other stuff, you know, most of it. Then we come to this one. Oh, I like this one very much too. This is, this gives you, let's see, one, two, three, four, something like 10, 10 bits of it. You get the Dance of the Clowns, you get the Funeral March. Yes, there is a Funeral March. You get the Wedding March and the, all the Elfin Fairies March thing. And then you get, of course, ye spotted Schlange, the snakes, Schlange in German, or Schlange. Here you go, Kubelik, Raphael Kubelik. Excellent, excellent version, kind of a classic in the German-speaking territories for Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream music. And it's a beautiful performance, absolutely first class. Also first class, as you might expect believe me, is Zell and Cleveland on Sony. Oh my, these are the the five sort of major pieces. The Overture, Scherzo, Nocturne, Intermezzo, and Wedding March. I mean, everybody does them in a different order, except that the Wedding March usually comes at the end for obvious reasons. But this is, this. I mean, it's Zell. It's like Toscanini updated and even better played. It's really, really, really amazing. And it's definitely worth seeking out if you don't have the big Zell box or you don't have... I've talked about everything on this disc. <laughs> it's really funny because this disc has Zell's Moldau, which is the best ever, and the Bizet Symphony in C with Stokowski, which is one of the great versions of that, and the Midsummer Night's Dream music with Zell. I mean, this is one hell of a disc if you could still find it. It was on Essential Classics. Wow, it was all terrific. But now we're coming to my three sort of top choices. One of them, and I, I just think this is beyond marvelous, this disc. And you get, let's see, you get the Overture, the March of the Fairies. Yeah, you get extended, extended things. The Intermezzo, the Wedding March is in the middle. The Dance of the Clowns, the Scherzo. Then you get Ye Spotted Snakes and the, the Nocturne and the Funeral March, and then the finale. It's actually a wonderful arrangement of pieces. I think it plays extremely well. You shouldn't follow the order of the play. There's no reason to particularly, although I don't know if this does or doesn't. I don't think it does. But, the, the, the you know, arrange it musically. Make a musically satisfying program, which is exactly what happens here. And the person who does it is Clamperer. You would think it would be slow and ponderous, and the Tempi are leisurely, but... Oh, it's gorgeous. Just gorgeous. I mean, you know, the woodwind playing in the overture is so beautiful. It's just wonderful. It's wonderful to hear. Again, it's like Harnoncourt in the sense that it's a performance that has, it just reeks of character, of the theater, of of, of stuff happening. It's, it's wonderfully dramatic and vivid and gorgeously recorded for its day. It comes with the Italian Symphony, also a very good performance of that. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's vintage, vintage Klemperer. And the singing is wonderful. The singing is wonderful. It's Janet Baker and Heather Harper. I mean, what could be bad? I mean, they only have about 30 seconds of music to sing. You know, you go, oh, you spotted snakes. You're very snaky and spotted. And that's that. But, you know, it's okay. Now, we're coming down to the end here. And there are two recordings that I think are really absolutely exceptional and modern and in like nice modern gorgeous sound this is kind of like Klemperer's you get the same stuff and this is Abado with the Berlin Philharmonic on Sony Abado was always a wonderful Mendelssohn conductor he really is first class Mendelssohn conductor he did all the symphonies on Deutsche Grammophon with the London Symphony but this one um, with the Italian Symphony and Midsummer Night's Dream music is one of his best, best recordings with the Berlin Philharmonic. It's, it's first class in every possible way. Beautifully done, beautifully recorded, gorgeous. Gorgeously played and a superb tribute to a conductor who I often am not very nice to, <laughs> I have to confess. But here, Abato really nails it. It's just a terrific disc. It really is. However, however, my favorite, the best, the one, the only, 
the most extended. You get a full disc of stuff, 55 minutes, all of the major music, all of the songs and choruses and melodramas, all the instrumental pieces, and all played to a fairly well. Is this one, Azawa with the Boston Symphony. Again, it's one of the great things that Azawa ever did with the Boston Symphony, one of his very, very best recordings. And wow, if you want, you know, not a lot of dialogue. The dialogue, by the way, is, is Judy Dench. I mean, what could be bad? It's Judy Dench, you know, what's her name from James Bond, you know, Judy Dench. And she's also made good movies, but uh, you, you know, she's a major actress. It's wonderful to hear Judy Dench, you know, reciting Shakespeare's lines. The soloists are Kathleen Battle and Frederica von Stade, or von Stade, since she's from New Jersey. It doesn't really get better than that, does it? Could it ever? I don't think so. I really don't think so. It, it is an absolutely marvelous, marvelous disc. And when I want to pull out uh, 55 minutes of a Midsummer Night's Dream music, this is the one I turn to. Seiji Ozawa with the Boston Symphony, the best, really the best. I mean, for what it is, you know, for the extended, almost complete incidental music um, without too much dialogue, but with everything that you'd ever want to hear. Um, it's, it's a fairly unique production for that reason and, and fantastic in every respect. So that is A Midsummer Night's Dream. Keep on listening, folks. Take care of yourself. All the best.